Okay, welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Hao Lingxing, who is a uh, Benjamin at Grace Wood, the third professor in public policy and sociology at Johns Hopkins University, and she's also the director of Johns uh, Hopkins Population Center. Professor Hao graduated from University of Chicago and worked at Maine and UIowa before she came to JSU in 1996. Her areas of interest include social inequality, migration, family demography, sociology of education, and computational methods. Her research appeared in top journals such as Demography, PNAS, AJS, Social Web, JMF, and so on. She received numerous prestigious grants from NIH and NSF. Professor Howe is a well-known methodologist, having published several sage little books, if you know what I'm talking about. Today, she will present one of her newest projects that is methodologically sophisticated and speaks to a wide audience who are interested in social inequality. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Howe. And before that, uh, we will uh, type our questions in the chat box, and then after Professor House talk, we will then come back to your chat questions one by one. So please welcome Professor Howe. Okay, thank you, everybody. So today I'm really excited to, to talk about this uh, ongoing project uh, to this uh, computational social science lab. I really hope that I learned a lot from you guys. So first, let me acknowledge my team. And this team, including one sociologist, one um, network uh, economician, and then four uh, <laughs> applied math and graph theorists, uh, including theory to, uh, from very senior uh, faculties to uh, students. So this uh, uh, research is supported by NSF and uh, NSF review reviewers say that this is a dream team. So we have to uh, take advantage of this team and then creating something as uh, interesting. So I would like to apply um, network science to the uh, sociological research. And here is some motivation. I mean, one major motivation is from the social stratification literature. Uh, in, my, in my view, it is quite um, occupation-centric and occupation-heavy. So from there, two questions arise. Why not study job mobility? Job itself, other than occupation mobility, only one side because job mobility encompass both occupation skills and workplace in industry. And then I, more importantly, I would like to know what is the labor market structure underlying job mobility. So, uh, so I want to uh, ask the question, what's the labor market structure underlying job mobility? Those are the social actors and workers, their you know, behavior. They move from job to job, right? And then we developed the concept of job mobility zones to characterize and model the underlying labor market structure at the micro level. Okay, so I'd like to summarize the uh, literature in two framework. And I put this uh, literature in one framework called static framework. This will include a class analysis of occupational mobility, including big classes and micro classes. You all know about that, right? And then we also um, uh, review, uh, put this in industrial structure thesis uh, under this static, static uh, framework, it emphasize occupational resources and vulnerabilities. And I also include the internal labor market here. And then the third one is the segmented labor market, the two ideal types of a primary uh, labor market and secondary sector. And then also later, we have this new labor market segmentation and job precarity. Now I'll put uh, another set of uh, literature in this dynamic framework, including vacancy chains. We can see chains as a thesis that link the mobility of individuals to cascading uh, vacancies from the filling of the initial vacancy within organizations. And then 
between organizations and the more generally I'll call that, uh, this is the uh, thesis called career lines. That's the types of a job sequences in the labor markets. So I'd like to uh, offer two critiques there and that's related and also motivated to this uh, uh, research is that both static and dynamic frameworks to rely on observed characteristics of jobs. They either rely on occupation classification or industry classification of a job, but seldom including both. And they also rely on workers observed uh, demographic characteristics. And neither framework addresses the structural positions of individual workers in the labor market. So in this paper, we argue the structure underlying job mobility causes both job mobility and labor market outcomes. So the paper is attempts to recover the underlying labor market structure. So we created a notion called job mobility zones. We define this, this um, concept as sets of job opportunities, each of which is common for a group of workers over a period. And the basic premise is that the observed job mobility manifests the underlying job mobility zones. And job mobility zones have the following properties. They allow differentiations of jobs by detail, occupation, and industry codes. It is inclusive of both between and within individual job opportunities. And it is in sensitivity to the time order of a job mobility. So the order or the sequence of jobs are not of our concern or interest. So we raised two sets of research questions. The first is the substantive. How do we recover the underlying job mobility zones from observed individual job mobility? Second, how do the recovered job mobility zones determine the labor market outcomes? Methodologically, we ask, we ask that is a network approach appropriate to the substantive questions at hand, which random graph model to use, and is the approach scalable and efficient? So let me uh, present you the, the data uh, we use is the Survey of Income and Program Participation, SIP 2014 panel. This is a repeated panel, and it is a household-based, nationally representative, longitudinal survey. And it is the primary source of a monthly job dynamics in the United States. This study used job mobility over 48 months from 2013 to 2016. Individuals report, reported up to seven jobs with detailed occupation industry code in a year. So they also provide other information, include labor market outcomes, wage job precarity, individual demographic characteristics, and job characteristics. So the study population is Americans from 16 to 65 years old in 2013. They were born from 1948 to 1997. They work for pay for at least, at least one month during the 48 months. So the analytic sample of workers include 12,000, more than 12,000 workers and they all observed all 48 months. So the person months count almost 600,000. How about the job? So the job would have a very granular occupation and industry codes. So we use the detailed occupation classification. We use a 535 of this you know, occupation codes, which is a lot more bigger than the a uh, micro class of uh, Gwaski and uh, Whedon and Gwaski, that is 126. 
So then we cross classify with the sub majority industries. So we use 20 of them. So the results is more than 3,000 granular all uh, occupation industry categories observed in our sample. By the way, guys, you can raise the classification questions if you uh, want. Otherwise, very hard, might be hard to uh, continue if it, I do not clarify. So, um, so please do. <laughs> Uh, you can put it in the chat. Maybe uh, Xi Qi can help me to clarify something uh, to, to in, enable this seminar. So here I emphasize we observe the employment relations here is between workers and occupation industry code. So the relations is between individuals, which are, are human actors, and occupation industry codes. These are classification, you know, or the uh, uh, you know types of uh, occupations and industries that you know represents a, a job. So a worker correlated to one or more occupation industry codes, and then we construct this re uh, rectangular matrix M. So workers are on rows, occupation industry on columns, so that you can see this um, matrix M is in the dimension of N which is the workers and M is the uh, uh, occupation and industry. It is a massive ma matrix. So let's see that what do we mean by connection or relations between two different kinds of nodes or vertices. Workers could be one type and here in the middle, you see this red word is workers represented in this illustration heuristic where they uh, we have uh, seven workers here, uh, represented by the, the circle, uh, solid circle. And then another types of vertices or nodes are called occupation industry codes, and we represent them as A, B, C, D. So then what we observe, for example, is worker two, work on job um, uh, with the occupation and industry A, B and B, right? And then, and and then you have a three as also work in in uh, A and B, and then through this relationship between worker and occupations, we can project from this so-called two mode or bipartite kind of network into a one mode workers network network. So here down in the, in the bottom, it is a network of workers. You can see that worker two is related to two, one, two, three, two, four, and two, five. And those kind of links is because they share in the, the industries and occupation. You can see from the bi bipartite network. On the other hand, you, we can also project the one mode um, uh, matrix for occupation and industry, you know, uh, illustrated on the top. Is there any questions about this illustration? I assume no. Okay, so by, from bipartite to one mode here, so in the matrix form, we have this bipartite between workers, we have this now, um, um, M times N, uh, we saw that matrix before. And then that projected into a one more workers uh, network. This worker network we call co-employment network of workers. So we call this networks as uh, matrix is A. A's dimension is N times N. We call that N as over 12,000. We make N is by multiply M with its transpose. So that will make the uh, projection of um, um, uh, matrix A. So then just to drive the idea home, this co-employment network of workers uh, is an adjacency matrix. It means it's a square matrix now is N times N, and it is symmetric as well because we are not uh, considered their directions. 
the co uh, employment uh, of two workers, if you, you're thinking about the entry of this matrix, any one entry of the matrix, is defined as being employed in the same one or more of the 3,254 occupation industry over the 48 months. So if we observe them in 48 months and they have multiple jobs. If there is an entry, that means that that entry is the shared industries and occupation. So then what's this matrix, which is a square matrix, and we choose the, uh, we, we assume that it is the labor market is structured and the structure in a way is like a clustered from the idea of a segmented labor market idea. So, um, so we want to recover such a network structure. What kind of models are we going to choose? So here is a, a talk about, I'm going to talk about very briefly, three related, um, you know, uh, models. So the stochastic block model, SBM, is the benchmark for um, uh, network models that want to recover their structure, the, the cluster structure. So the vertices, vertices is belong to K distinct blocks. And then the connectivity probability depends on vertex block membership. Based on this benchmark, there is a, another um, model called latent position model. This latent position model we we'll assume that every vertex vertex have its own its own uh, uh, latent position in the graph uh, space, and the con connection probability is given by Euclidean distance function. And the third one is called random dot product graph RDPG, and this is again the same as the latent position model that assume each vertex has a latent position in the graph space, and that but the connect, connection probability is given by a link function of the dot product. Dot product is the inner product. I'm going to illustrate with the four uh, vertices, and these four vertices are in two blocks or two clusters. So it's under SBM. So we have this uh, one, two, three, four vertices, and they are, are inherently, they belong to two blocks. And in the membership of the, these two um, uh, vertices, so they, we assume them they are all four into the uh, centroid of this uh, plot, block. And then the same thing assumed for these two, uh, the other two um, uh, vertices. The, the centroid is the posi latent position for th these two uh, uh, vertices. Now, under latent, um, latent uh, position models, and, and here the link uh, function is using Euclide Euclidean distance. So we look at the Euclidean distance is this straight line, the shortest distance between two um, vertices. So say that, look at these two vertices. Do you see my uh, cursor? So the Euclidean distance is determined by, you know, this you know, square that I'm in the triangle. So you can get this um, Euclidean distance. You can see very clear that this distance between these two is much shorter than between these, uh, call this one, I should put the number there, and these two. So that they are, uh, these two um, uh, vertices are much farther away. They are not belong to the same uh, 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 blocks. In this uh, RDPG, we say that we use the um, dot product or inner product, which is using angular coarseness. So from the origin, you can see this, you know, um, the, 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 the angle uh, between these two um, vertices is much smaller than uh, between uh, this vertice, vertice and this vertice, or the other one as well, right? So this one, okay, right to, to that. So these are just the illustration of the three uh, models, okay? 
So we chose the RDPG because the dot product is a very efficient way and scalable way to, um, to embed the, the matrix. Um, so to compare to uh, compare these two and say what are the uh, this is three models so what are the similarities and what are the differences under the similarities so these three models so they all assume independent edge model uh, I'm going to elaborate a little bit about this uh, independent uh, because there might be questions about that and then we have uh, also these edges are random they are not deterministic is a probabilistic. And the latent position of, of the uh, vertices, so they are all assumed that there is a latent position of a vertices in all three models. And the underlying this, you know, these, these, these uh, latent positions that have the block structures, they belong to quite separated, you know, uh, clusters and blocks. What are the differences? So for the latent positions um, under this uh, uh, topic, SBM will assume that the latent positions, as I show you, is in the central of the block. For latent positions models and RDBG, uh, RDPG, and then we say that latent positions within the blocks are follow a probability distribution. So it has its unknown uh, parameters. And the estimation methods also differ. So from uh, for SBM and latent position, we use the maximum likelihood or variational approximation. For RDPG, we using a, uh, we use adjacency spectral embedding and Gaussian mixture modeling. To object, but I'm going to do that a little bit with the equations. So in this paper, we use RDPG, the last one. And it is, we specify the co-employment probability. So the co-employment is the edges. We say that they are independent, but they conditional on latent positions of workers. So latent positions of workers i from i equal to i equal to one to n, we have, we call that the latent position called x sub i. So the A matrix is we make it um, parsimony. We reduce the weights into binary zero one. And then we are not interested in the direction of, from, from one worker to the other. And then we, we assume that there is no self uh, link because you, you, you stay in the same job. It's just, there's no interest to study that link at all. So then we uh, specify the probability as a function. This probability function has a, a logic link uh, based on uh, Bernoulli uh, uh, distribution. So we have this you know, logic link. You can see this is the probability expression with the logic link. And in the, the, the function is the dot product. So the dot product is xi transpose to xj. So i and j is two different uh, vertices. So for um, uh, the entry of a, um, uh, a matrix, any entry of a, a matrix for worker j with uh, worker uh, i, and then the probability will be a function, a, a logic function, uh, um, logistic function of the inner product. So the inner product here, when you look at this is like only one dimension. And actually we, we say that we're going to tell you that we are reducing that very high dimension into low dimension, but it is not one. So the dot product is, is coming from here. You have a product to say that uh, D, this first dimension, and then you have the first dimension Xi times Xj. And then you press the second dimension you have, have an x i2 and then uh, j i2. So this you uh, sum them up, so it's an inner product. So that's the uh, expression of the inner product and it's the name of dot product graph. So this um, 
methods and the way that conceptualization of labor market is quite different from the recent work. There's a very good recent work um, using network science to recover class structure. So I would like to focusing on a number of questions to see what's the major differences between our model and the recent work. I want to pay, uh, pay attention to uh, what are the nodes and what are the edges? What, uh, what are static and what are dynamic? And what is the specification for the connectivity probability? And is the community detection methods scalable and efficient? Are the block membership is for workers or for occupations? These are the major you know, questions. Um, I could not include in, uh, uh, many, but I, I include two um, AJS paper. One is the recent 2022 uh, by Lin and Hong and uh, 2020 by Chang and Park. And the current paper is listed as the first uh, column. So I look at the data. Data is different as you, you, you already told you, we use the SEP. And SIP have a monthly job mo uh, mobility. CPS is many people use it for uh, occupation um, mobility. But then, okay, okay uh, CPS and give the you know two one transitions, right? So only as an annual, annual, and so one uh, transitions. But they can look at a lot more uh, uh, longer period. So both uh, both Lin and these two previous work use CPS data. The setups are quite different. Our current day, uh, model is to, the setup is the, the relationship between workers on one side, occupation and industries on the other, which is called by Partai. And in Lin and Hang is uh, occupation to occupation. This is a transition uh, or uh, mobility table. And Chang and Park is also occupation to occupation is transition matrix. The matrix um, in our case is adjacency matrix as well, but it is for workers. It is projected from the bipartite relationship we observed. And uh, the uh, Lin and Hang is adjacency matrix for occupation, same as for Chang and Park. The mobility, we look at job mobility. And uh, in a 48 months, totally observed month by month, uh, 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 such a period. For Ning and Hang, it's occupation mobility in three uh, periods. Those three period in each of the period, they uh, pull the data and then study our uh, annual uh, two jobs, uh, uh, the occupation of two jobs. Okay, the, the similar thing is for Chang and, and Park. What are the nodes? The nodes in, 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 in uh, the networks. So in our paper is workers. For Ning and Hang and Chang and Park, they are all for occupations. What are the edges? In our paper, it's the shared uh, occupation and industry, which is, which is a cross classification. And in Ning and Hang and the other two papers, they are the size of the workers who exchange uh, occupations or, or who um, in, in Chang and Park's case, uh, case is the size of the worker flows between occupation and a year. What is the network? So our network is the most parsimonious, it's a binary undirected. And the uh, Ling and Hang uh, uh, is uh, undirected and weighted and Chang and Pa is directed and weighted. The latent structure for us is the static. We're looking at a you know, block structure in one period. We call that as a four year, 48 uh, uh, months period. Uh, Lin and Hong is to pull static um, uh, structure in three period. So it's just to pull them together and study each of period one at a time, pull them. Chang and Park to study the dynamics in the three period. So how about the community detection uh, methods? So we have, uh, uh, we use the RDPG and then RDPG is get the latent position estimated. And then we use the Gaussian uh, mixture modeling to, uh, to estimate the, um, the clusters or blocks. For Lin and Hong, uh, it used five, to compare five uh, different algorithms, but these algorithms are not model based and uh, including InfoMat. And Chang and Park is using also non model based algorithm and is using Info, InfoMat. 
So I want to emphasize that our paper is uh, model-based. So our method is model-based. So the next, I'll just show you results. I hope I, I don't uh, bo uh, bother, <laughs> but you know, bore you too much. Uh, here's the results. So using the uh, RDPG model, and then we come up with this uh, network. So we want to know the network degree distribution. Uh, it's a degree distribution for the entire network, which remember it is 12, more than 12,000 by 12,000. And it looked like this is very much like, a, you know, is a power law-like uh, distribution. In, in price, so you can look at that, it's very few have, you know, many, many, uh, degrees, it means that they are connected to, to many people, the very left the bar. And you'll see that many, many people and come down to here have very few, maybe only linked to one, right? So those are in the, you know, or some of them does not even link, it uh, isolates. So that's the in, entire network's uh, degree distribution that become, you know, uh, zero, cut down to this zero, right? So uh, so that's the co-employment network. It's a very sparse binary network. Okay, so that means that the number of edges is a small fraction of the maximum number of edges. Now we uh, use the largest component of this network. The largest component um, uh, yeah, uh, can, can consist of uh, more than 99.5% of all the uh, nodes, uh, workers. And after that, uh, there, there are 73 isolated workers, okay? So um, so you can see a little bit less sparse if you can you know, look at the, compare these two um, degree uh, distribution. Sparseness is a challenge uh, for doing analysis, okay? So the, the task is to reduce the very, very high dimension of the matrix to 12,000 by 12,000, and then make it to 12,000 by here, our results are by three. Now the low dimension is three, uh, uh, and the way to do it is using adjacency spectral embedding, ASE, and then the left, uh, this uh, this graph is called squee, squee plot. The squee plot is uh, plotting the eigenvalue from and uh, order them from high to low. And here's the first 10 of them. And you can see that they rapidly decline. That means that you can just use, ignore the smaller eigenvalue and keep the larger eigenvalue, which will remain, you know, retain the structure of the network. So that's the idea of the reducing the high dimension so that it's manageable, we can do the estimates. So uh, in this, this graph, we use, you know, we keep these three eigenvalues. And then we, we call that, you know, it's a I, uh, um, diagonal matrix uh, uh, with um, these three values, right? So that's how we decide, decide this, you know, uh, D. And then once you have the D, then we can, you know, estimate the, uh, the latent uh, positions of each worker. So each worker so would have their latent positions by using, you know, half of this, you know, uh, 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 ASE uh, uh, decomposition. After the, so now we have the latent positions and scattered in, you know, in a structured way, scattered in the three dimension space. Now the job is now how to cluster them together. Now we use, we say that we use the Gaussian mixture modeling, Gaussian Assume, uh, mixture modeling, GMM, assumes all the data points are generated from a mixture of a finite number of a Gaussian distribution with unknown parameters. So what are the unknown param parameters? They are the mean, because it's a Gaussian, right? So the means and um, covariance, because it's a multi-dimension, three-dimension, so it's not variance anymore, it's a covariance. Okay, so we cluster the latent position of a workers. So all those, you know, X hat uh, sub I is each of the workers that have a position. We estimate them already. We have a hat there. 
And then by doing so, we, we come up with 12 job mobility zones. So we call that job mobility zone C. In fact, it's, it's here is the clusters or blocks we come up with uh, uh, from the GMM. And the criteria is to use the big Bayesian criteria, uh, uh, information criteria, which is um, uh, applied to this model, will uh, decide both the model, the covariance model, and the number of clusters, or we call it these zones. So here you can see that the larger of the larger is the value, uh, the the big is the better of the results in this uh, um, particular um, uh, software. So we will see that if you, you will say there is no um, uh, clusters at all, there's only one, it's a one very homogeneous labor market. And then the big is very low is this point. It's rapidly increased and then by six to six and then it's, it's slow down and then come to 12 is the maximum you know, value. So we decided to use the 12, but if you want to practically useful, you could choose 10, you could you know, compare with eight or even with the six. And these are uh, the probabilistic result is you know, to do with which one you want more practically easier to interpret or, or, or you know, capture all the uh, structure. Yes, and what, what we get is 12 job and mobility. Once. So here is the three dimension. We can show you the uh, the zones. So the zones here I show you on the left is the eleven separated zones, and some of them are scattered more than others. Right? You can see some of the dot is a smaller a smaller circle, which doesn't mean the size. It just means that the latent positions are very close to each other, like this uh, green one. Right. Now you see this gray one and this uh, another green one, so like they are together, actually they are separated. Okay, it's just, you just three dimension, you see it in two dimensions, harder to see. And these are the eight, you can even in a two dimension view of a three dimension picture, you can see they are clearly separated, okay? However, we have a tool. Remember we have a 12 zones. We have a one zone is scattered everywhere. And here, the GMM actually is to make these uh, workers as a one zone and a, it's a, a residual zone. That means that they do not follow, these workers do not follow in the Gaussian distribution. And then they're going and they could not go, you know, uh, identify them into any, into any of those 11 ones. So in the complete picture, you can see all 12 zones in the labor market uh, reduced dimensions. So we see in here the three dimensions. This is the labor market structure, or we call that job mobility zones. Here's the underlying job mobility zones. So this is the, you know, underlying the job uh, mobility we observed. And these zones then become the structure, you know, characteristics. And what about their size? And here you can see. Uh, zone one, the size is huge and almost half, 47%. Another zone is a very large too, is almost 20%. Some of them are smaller and the smallest is, is uh, zone, zone A, this uh, brown one, it's only 1.6%. Which one is the residual one? The residual one is zone seven. It accounts for 4.9%. This is a dark navy blue. This one is the residual one. Okay. So the 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 size of that dot does not mean you know the size of the workers. So what about the descriptive, you know, uh distribution uh, across this 12 uh, job mobility? We can look at workers' attributes by zones. Here you can on, on the left side I just uh, look uh, um, a chart um, gender, married, and uh, bachelor's degree. If you look at uh, gender, right? So gender. So this is the male. Uh, male is the blue bar. So you can see that female concentrated means the very short blue bar is in zone two, three, and eight. 
something like that. You can see that the uh, you know characteristics, the workers' characteristics, are not you uniformly distributed by the zones, not totally random, but it is a systematic in a way that because these zones are implicated, you know, uh, in the uh, job mobility, which is we observe and use it to recover the zones. Okay, so on the right side, which I, I'm very interested in, in migration, so immigrants, you can see that immigrants are black and also black and Latinx are in zone, uh, those are the yellow ones. Yellow bars are in zone eight, right? This is high and 12. These two are higher. So the, the characteristics and demographic characteristics of workers are vary by zones. How about job uh, characteristics? We uh, measure unionized contract. So high unionized contract is in um, it's the blue bar, which is zone three. So it's the highest compared to all the rest. Right? And then we'll have a very, a very many private sectors in particular high from four and then four and six to uh, 12. And how about the size of the firms? And we can see zone three have a, a mid, many mid-sized firms, which is 50 to 500. And then you have a one, two, which is the, uh, um, so, so uh, large size is the uh, one, two, and five. Okay. So we do not, directly connected to the previous uh, literature. But this, you know, structured and segmented labor market is pretty much is like, uh, we are now able to measure labor market segments. And compared to the ideal type of primary seg segments and secondary segments, we can see that job mobility zones one to six are in the primary segments, but they are different. So they are actually have within by, uh, primary uh, segments so we can see the heterogeneity. And then we see uh, job mobility zones, eight to 12 is belong to secondary segments. And then we, and also is within have a heterogeneity variations as well. And more importantly, this job market is not completely segmented we have this residual zones and people are moving across this graph space, means that they are changing jobs of very different types. So there, there are some rooms for, you know, floating of the, you know, job changes or exchanges. Okay, you might ask me why this numbering is so orderly. Why one to six I belong to primary segments and eight to 12 is, you know, in the secondary. We just re remembering the, the the zones. So when you uh, use GMM to get the clusters, the, all those numbering from the software, uh, I mean the package is not is just arbitrary. So we just rank these zones by the mean of the wages, which is everybody looking at wages. So so it's just by the mean wages we we'll rank them so that we know one to six is higher than seven, seven is higher than eight to uh, twelve. Okay, so that's that's ex explain some of this mystery here. Okay. So what about the job mobility zones? Do I have time? Quickly. I have two. I have time, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I would like to answer questions more. So here is, you know, it's good to see that, you know, we, we measure the job mo uh, uh, mobility zone, which is the latent structure. This is structural uh, course. It's, it's a course of both job mobility as well as life chances, which we can measure for uh, by uh, labor market outcomes. So the um, 
the major explanatory variables in this job, uh, I mean, labor market outcome um, uh, functions would be the job mobility zones. That's our uh, focus, but we also have a covariates. So we measure workers covariates, you're already exposed to those covariates when we look at the dis distribution across the zones, and as well as the job covariates. So the job market outcomes are used two uh, measures. One is the log hourly wage, and the second is the job uh, work uh, precarity using uh, the first the principal component from the PC, the principal component analysis. So we have three variables here. Um, it's absence of uh, employer provided the health insurance um, and the absence of the employer employer provided pension and and then it's the you know workers lost their control of their work time as an involuntary part time so here just the standard random effect panel data analysis so why is the dependent variables t is the months of 48 months right so we have this uh the first dependent variables a lot ways the second is that so uh, z is the job mobility zone membership each individual will have a clear identification of the the, the workers in which particular zone, according to the largest uh, probability uh, uh, we, we um, uh, estimated. Okay, and then C is uh, regarding to all other uh, uh, covariates, and U sub I is the random effect. So this is the standard random effect panel data analysis. So I have three models. Model one is covariates only. And model two is to add the job mobility zones. And the blue uh, marks are for model one and the uh, gold is for uh, model two. So you can see that there is an, uh, adding this um, uh, zone mobile, uh, job mobility zones does not change much of this uh, uh, individual um, and job characteristics the effect on wage. So this is dependent variable is a wage. So you can see some of the changes maybe is not significant, but you can see size change is for gender and for black and for Hispanic. And by controlling for the job mobility zones, they are moving towards zero. Others are much less. Okay, this is saying that the uh, to me, is the uh, adding the job mobility zones and the mobility zones and capture some of the structure um, characteristics of the labor market is could not be reflected uh, by the uh, individuals and uh, job characteristics, and they are uh, not as uh, dependent as well. However, when we add the model zero here. I would just include only job mobility zones. And then model two is the previous model two, both job mobility zones and covariates. So what is the, the model zero is the green marks and then the uh, gold is still for model two. So you can see that there is a, uh, some significant differences uh, and the particularly in the uh, secondary labor market type, you know, the, the, the lower one. So we can we can get into more and to to to, to understand what what's that that for uh, later on when we have uh, more time and ask, uh, answer other questions as well. Okay, here is something is about the um, uh, the dependent variable is precarity, and then you can see be Precarity is a negative outcome, right? So then you can see that the effect is on the different side, um, the coefficient on different sides. But again, you see that's a pretty much not, you know, change much except that again, uh, gender and uh, race uh, for some size changes. Okay, this is a job with precarity. You can also see that uh, uh, comparing the uh, two models for uh, focusing on job mobility zones. So you can see some of the significant change and uh, not a lot of changes. Okay, so it's just the zones uh, explain uh, precarity extremely well. Okay, so um, what is uh, 
the analysis uh, we could we 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 uh, can uh, come up with some uh, some conclusion, of course, tentative. Substantively, we ask can the underlying job mobility zones be detected from the observed individual job mobility? We say yes. So we uh, recover twelve zones as the maximum, you know, the 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 best fit model. How do the recovered job mobility zones determine labor market outcomes? So it's very strongly. And now I have a very little, you know, um, some, uh, some kind of hint that part of the gender and racial discrimination may be due to the job mobility zones. And how about methodology? We say that it's a networked approach, um, particularly the modeling, appropriate for the substantive questions at hand. We say uh, yes uh, by this exercise. Uh, which model to choose? So we want to choose uh, PD. Uh, uh, RDPG, that's the the third one uh, from from uh, from uh, uh, from we list of the three models, and then we choose it because it is scalable and 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 efficient. Not the first two, but only uh, RDPG. So uh, then, where am I? So I saw that I have. What is the next step? So the next step is to use. Um, and remember, SIP is the survey data. When you have a survey data for workers, workers are representative. Workers' jobs are not representative, right? You got to, you know, recognize this limitation there. Now, I would like to next step. In fact, I get the approval to use this confidential data as administrative data in longitudinal employer household dynamics, LEHD. It has the entire workforce and entire sets of firms. We can go down to the firms other than occupation cross-classified with the industry. Many, many firms, 59 million firms and 150 time, 59 million workers at one time points. We have 80 quarters of the data. This is really data science, big data. How are we going to, from the entire labor, market to we can come up with the most you know we hope is to get to really get to the bottom of the labor market structure by using this you know both sides are representative that's our you know very important empir empirical application uh, for this uh, project and then but uh, uh, methodologically we have many things to do and then we, one thing you immediately say that why use a binary? <laughs> you know, when you do the, the, the dot product and then you definitely have a not binary, right? You have a sharing one or sharing two, sharing uh, nine uh, jobs. You could sharing many, there are, you know, numbers there. We turned it into zero, one for pass money and two is for the model. It is influential, only binary at this stage, um, uh, binary, uh, uh, graph could be uh, influential. That that we know the limiting behavior. We have the central limit theorem for this binary, you know, matrix. For others, we have no, you know, uh, um, uh, such a proof yet. We are working on it. Okay, so we want to have, you know, inferential random uh, uh, graph models and to apply to the very important empirical question. And and but we do need to, you know, go to the weighted. Uh, code employment uh, networks so for the for the probability um, um, you know uh, specifications is easy from binary to you know from from logic to you know uh, Poisson it's easy to use a different statistical model but the graph model is not to that stage yet well also uh, actually we have a work on adding the vertex uh, uh, covariates. So the vertex covariates might be, you know, actually um, explicitly, not implicitly, to you know, to to determine the uh, latent to uh, to help to recover the latent uh, uh, labor market structure. So that's the uh, vertex uh, covariates. For example, how about race? How about how about gender? To to including those observed covariates in the RDPG, which is there's no covariates at all, right? So what we have is the observed job mobility data. You know that's where we have to 
uh, and uh, uh, recover the labor market. So we are we have work on that. We are um, uh, including um, covariates, but cannot including many, and can only include uh, discrete covariates. So we do have a publication and have a R package called GRDPG with covariates, and that that's uh, just published for that one. We also develop a dynamic R D. Uh, uh, GRDPG model, we need to explain over time how this labor market structure change. Okay, let me get out of here. Stop sharing. <laughs> Stop sharing. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Hao. Uh, we can now Q&A and uh, Professor Time is the first in the queue. He asked, um, glad to see a comparison with two recent AGS papers uh, in the presentation. I see the most central differences are job versus occupation, model-based uh, or not. Question is, can you do both and compare? Can I do both? Uh, I can do occupation. I definitely can do just without without uh, industry, and that's called occupation. You know, very detailed occupation, um, change the occupation, and and that model would be a lot less uh, sparse. But to me, it's it's a loss of my interest because <laughs> it is not a labor market structure. It's not a complete structure. It does not reflect jobs are not you know in reality. You change, you change a job, you change a job, you might be in the same place, but many, many times you change job to go to another workplace. Workplace is not just say I drive a car for five minutes or drive a car for, uh, for 15 minutes. Sure, you have that differences too, but you go to different industry, or same occupation, different industry means a completely different thing. Right, so you go to you know a big firm and a small firm, completely different thing, same occupation, right? So you can change the occupation and then you 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 save the same um, My uh, point is remain so the that. same. Yeah, tell me know what you want me to do. <laughs> point is not favoring occupation. My point is for people in sociology who have been. Uh, obsessed with occupation and yeah. can only start with occupation. Uh, they have to know what would be wrong if you don't show them the in according to your method. If you do different level of aggregation <clears throat> mm -hmm. or the uh, breakdown to the better, more reasonable, uh, conceptually more desirable level of analysis being job. Uh, it, it, you can show them, right? Uh, that is using I, your method, yeah, comparing I, yourself from the top. That's a big lesson. Okay, okay and, so and I, 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 now I know, yeah, continue. The other, it's another comparison. Okay, so you are saying that if I use my methods and do the analysis, something like that? I uh, have a problem. I have a problem of these two papers. They, their, their registers or nodes are occupations. My nodes are workers. I want to know the workers in the, in the in the structure, right? So when you have occupation, you cluster the occupation. I mean, those are two papers. So the cluster the occupation, they have this structure, underlying structure of the occupation. So how are you going to use this underlying structures and to yeah. model the, the life chances? Because I could have two occupations or three occupations, which one I'm going to use? That is what I mean is before you generate the adjacency matrix for workers, you don't start with job. You start with uh, the job on one dimension of your data, one mode of your data. Oh, you're saying we do the other mode, yeah. You can do that, right? Uh -huh, definitely, I can do, I actually did that <laughs> also. Okay, 
So the, we have the bipartite networks and you can project it to the workers. Uh, one mode, you can project it to the occupation industry mode, one mode, yes. I did both. I put them all together actually to do the embedding at the same time. We do the multi mode, you know, embedding. Yeah, we can do that, or you can use, you know, singular value decomposition methods to do the two different kinds of uh, nodes. Yeah, the, the idea is, you know, these two nodes, actually, I mean, two types of nodes, you do this, the structure, they are reflecting to each other. Right, it's just the no levels are not the same because in my one mode, the edges are industries and occupations. Right. So 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 uh, you. And then, the, what's the difference can, in sub findings? The the difference in sub uh -huh. in finding. So in, in findings, I, um, I look at both. I mean, it's very hard to use the other um, projection, the uh, occupation and industry to match it to the individual because the individuals move job between jobs. So I was just using the first one, you know. So the first one's occupation and industry to match it to the structure to that. And the model is much less powerful you know, so it's also, it's a handicapped. I'm not, you know, fully reflect. There's a person's in the labor market. I'm just using the first one to do the analysis. Yeah. I mean, I could do that. I mean, I could just do that and to compare, you know. <laughs> yeah, comparing is the point. My point is not to defeat yourself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Model based features, the purely uh, data-driven computational approach like InfoMap. Mm -hmm. InfoMap is not model-based. That's InfoMap why algorithm. comparing no, so no, huh? with their approach of non-model-based. I would call that non-model-based. I might be wrong, tell me. Because there's no model for the connect connectivity probability. I cannot see one model there. I, I can specify the model, the probability distribution for the probability connection probability as a model, right? So you have a SBM, you have this latent positions and have RDPG and GRDPG. All this we specify the probability connectivity. For the data-driven algorithm, they just say here is the network, any network, right? So then we assume there's a block structure there. Let's partition them. So there is a different way, ways of partition, partition many, like a random first and then combine them or from one big one and divide it by smaller one and nearest, you know, uh, neighbor. And, and there's a many different, you know, info, all these different methods are, Data driven. Say that what kind of a cluster will fit this data the best. So that's the the, the prediction kind, right? So we want this explanation part. So we say that this is a Benoni kind of a probability of a binary. Of a, I don't care about how many occupation and industry they share. So long as they share, then it's one. It's a Benoni, you know, experiment. To follow the Bononi distribution, right? So, so that's the that's the model. If I do the weighted uh, the edge, I will use a Poisson distribution. So my I am reading this. I'm trying to find where is the model for the connectivity probability, right? So the, there's a more you know theorems to follow up because this this model. The, the uh, RDPG and GRDPG would have this central limit theorem. As the N, as the nodes increase, actually they become better. So you become, you know, all the results and become better and better. So that's the central limit theorem can be proved. You, you use an algorithm, you don't know the limiting behavior. 
you don't know. Here is the data you do. You, you do that, you know, next to data, you do, do that again. You know, it's a very much sample based, it's a car. It's a sample based, you know, uh, methods and they use the CPS, which is not a neighbor for, I mean, it's not it's population uh, data. So it's, a, it's a hard, it's a sample. So this is sample and that sample might not be the same. There's a no central limit theorem. There's a no limiting behaviors that I mean you can you can rely on. There's no standard error you can you can specify it. you can uh, specify you can uh, actually uh, obtain. You know I think Ning and Hong is using no it's Cheng and Park are using uh, bootstrapping to do the you know the the uh, the you know the CI you know confidential interval, but it is not model based. So I, I feel that model base is important. And then the, the clustering is also model based. The GMM is model based. So we have the you know adjacency matrix um, uh, embedding is model based, and then we have this, you know, uh, clustering is a model based. So it's a double <laughs> model based approach. And it could be scale up. You know, such a big um, matrix to 12,000 by 12,000, two minutes. I can do that job. Mm -hmm. uh, if I you use the maximum the... likelihood, you cannot do it. It just when, just break my system. You cannot, cannot even run it. Yeah. Network analysis is using very tiny, small you know, sample size. It cannot do the you know, data science. Now we have really huge data. And then we need to solve for that problem as well. Yeah. Well, so I can see all the sources of the base. I'm uh, suggesting that it may still be useful for you to also do the sample driven method to see the clustering you get. Out I cannot do this work, data. So called job the breakdown. Clusters. I cannot do it. Too big. Well, you know how big the data they, they use, oh. how many? Chang and, and Park is a 74 Small. occupations. Mm -hmm. It breaks okay. down. I cannot do it. <laughs> Even okay. using my occupation industry cross classify only 3,000, you cannot do it. It's just you can. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a, 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 a request <laughs> for scalable, efficient, you know, inferential model. I really cannot just say do all the things I compare, like uh, like Lin and Chong would compare five with different algorithm, right? They do they do how many? They do one hundred and forty seven. They do more. It seems like more than uh, seventy four. I, I forgot the exact. It is three digit. Everybody do three digit, and network. If we we are still thinking about that, we are not using network science to do anything. Society is big, you know, so I cannot just, just do the, a few hundred. Yeah, I just can't. I just can't offer that. Okay. Unless I said um, I'm just doing the 74, you know, you know. There's a no, actually no, no, you know, use for that because I like model based ones, you know. So we can do model based for 74, you know, but I don't like it, occupation. No, there's an occupation. I want person where this worker situated in the labor market. What kind of structure position this person is occupying? But for, of course, I only know that for years. So that's why I need a uh, um, dynamic model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our next slide is Wilson, who is an assistant professor in our department. Hi, Professor Hao. Uh, nice to meet you Hi. again. <laughs> uh, so, uh, thank, you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for the you. great talk. So, the idea of linking workers to occupations uh, is really inspiring. And I really like that because I think it is more consistent with our intuition of understanding job market and job mobility. Um, but uh, maybe I missed it, uh, but I'm not quite sure how uh, this approach uh, would capture those workers who do not quite change their jobs.
particularly uh, when your data is just, uh, uh, I think maybe a few years, right? So if I do not change my job in this time, and then I'm only linked to one occasion, and then how uh, would you model this? Uh, so in this case, would the model or would this approach be more suitable for those workers who frequently change their job or not? So that is my first question. Uh, so my second question is whether it is possible for you to theorize uh, your findings um, because uh, I think to me or maybe to the general audience, it is a little difficult to understand those findings and link it to the general literature about social stratification and mobility. So for instance, there are 12 mobility zones identified, uh, but we do not quite understand those differences or characteristics of these zones, although you use some job characteristic to describe that, but uh, in general, they are just the numbers, right? I think uh, it would be better if we have some labels to understand, okay, this zone is what, and that zone is what. And also because it, the findings are mainly data-driven, so without a clear theory, I think maybe when we change the data, change the cohorts, maybe we could discover more zones or fewer zones. So in that sense, uh, I think it would limit it, the generalability of this approach. So of course, theorizing uh, of your research. So if you think this is not quite relevant or necessary to this method, then please just ignore my second question. Yeah, these are two of my questions. <laughs> Very good questions. I uh, won't uh, ignore at all, and I will seek help also. But let's let me talk about the first one. How about the workers who do not change jobs within forty eight um, uh, months? The eighty, forget eighty some percent of them do not change job. They are all in the network. That's why there's such a sparse network. Okay, they still link to other people because we are not really the firm level, because uh, um, survey data, you can't have a firm ID, so you cannot really using firm to link them. So I have to use the occupation codes and industry code, which I saw is much closer to the firm <laughs> than just occupation, okay? So uh, so then means that even though they are not the same kind, the same firm and doing the same job, the people are linked together, right? So long as you have A, this A job is, you know, kind of a job, we'll call that occupation slash industry, uh, shared by two people, they are linked. Okay, in the, in the, in the projection. So why include them? I, I do not, you know, exclude them. They are there. <laughs> yeah. So, so they are there. Actually, they are playing very important role as well because, the, the, you know, how many jobs to sharing? I make them all one anyhow. It's a binary um, a network at this point, at this stage, I do binary network. A binary network means nine become one, you know, so long as one and above all become one. Mm -hmm. So you don't change a job. Other people use this kind of job, but also do this job, they are there, they are linked. So I have, I show you, we only have 73 isolates and those are not, you know, linked to any, anybody, I don't include them. So in my analysis, I use the largest component in the network science and network, uh, you know, approach. A largest component is mean that this, you know, any nodes in any way is linked to another one. It must be linked in, in order to be in one component. So they are in the largest component, only uh, point, less than 0.5%, 73 individuals are not included. Even 48 months, it will surprise you. So this is a, such a national labor market. We have to study national labor market. Okay, about theorizing. So I theorize is based on the two frameworks that one is static and one is a dynamic framework and, and put all these very basic theories together. And I claim that this study is using all of them. 
Okay, those are my theory bases, but any one is not enough. Any one of them is not enough. One is, I have a two major critique, right? The one is that they do not, they, they use the observed. Observe the characteristics and observe occupation, you know, um, um, not the recent work. I mean, the recent work is, is Nathan, okay? The recent work is great, you know? So I put it separately. I don't want to put it in there. The, the more classical one is observed. You use occupation, you just, you know, go swap and just say, okay, which one is, you know, big classes and just classify them. They become big classes, right? So you have a Whedon and, and you know, Gwaski, they use the more detail, but it's 215, is it? No, 126 probably, but also using, you know, professional association using other, um, uh, um, um, organizational characteristics and to enrich that kind of, you know, uh, classification, I mean, the classes. So those classes are observed. They are observed. Then the segmented labor market is ideal type. It just causes and effect everything put together, right? You have the, the course and you have the labor market effect put together and then to classify what is the primary you know, labor market, what is the secondary labor market? Completely ideal type and not measurable, you know, theoretical only, right? So I like vacancy chains. I like Korean, you know, lines. These are dynamic and looking into the, you know, individual job changes within the organization because this, you know, this, this, this position is vacant and this one fill in and everything have to fill, you know, change. There's a chain of the job, you know, changes there. And then those, you know, career line, you see that your career line. So you can cross the organization, you can do your, your following. It's a very much um, um, a temporary order that is the sequence is very important in those kind of theorizing. So for me, I want to simplify that, but I want to use this down to the individual level, micro level, which is, you know, in a worker's level. And then my second critique is that both static and, and, and dynamic conceptualizations, they do not look at the latent structure. Structures are latent. And then here comes to how am I going to theorizing and then give a label of each of these 12 zones, right? So right now I'm doing this, I see that one to six is corresponding to primary, but it's within that primary um, segment, there's a lot of differences. And then these differences is, is smaller than the differences from the, you know, uh, eight or 12. Eight or 12 zones that are belonging to the secondary ones. And then we add this, you know, floating ones also. So how to label is a great question. You know, the original label is arbitrary. They give you the result, 12 of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, 12. And I make it a little bit more meaningful is they say, okay, by outcome, you know, I just rank them by mean and wages. And then give a little bit ordering so they're not, you know, one, 12, you know, that. But how I'm going to give a name? I try, I try to give the names, but I all use the observed characteristics to name it. It's not the way to do it. I can do that, you know, the percentage of workers who are more black immigrants, and I call that, you know, black immigrant zone, you know. I can, that's not my idea in fact <laughs> you know so the idea is underlying structure what i'm trying to capture is the institutions is the norms is the written regulations or unwritten norms in this you know exercise in this period by these firms and 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 by these occupational structures so those are the things that i try to capture and i would capture them and they can, they are not like a one big, you know, homogeneous thing. And it is, it is a segments, you know, a set of segments. But how to name, label each of these? I have a huge problems. 
So I want, I invite you to help me to think about that. But I saw that I theorized them already. I No, I probably did not theorize them very well in today, but I'm trying to capture is those, the, the, the unwritten norms and, you know, in informal, formal and informal norms and uh, regulations of institutions and organizations. And there are many of them in the, in the US labor market. And those, that's why they are relatively independent of workers' characteristics or a particular job's characteristics because they are capturing completely different things. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Since we still have uh, Jamie, I think we should switch to Jamie's question. Jamie is also an assistant professor in our department. Hi, hi, Lisa. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Jamie. Um, so I'm more of like network scholar. So I found your talk interesting. Uh, in your detecting the mobility zone, I think overall it's, it's great idea. Um, so I have a question slash like suggestion. Uh, related to my question, like, you know, how do you evaluate and quantify the quality of the partitioning of mobility zones? So I know that you know the twelve twelve zone is an optimal solution based on the Gaussian mixture model. But I think within that, like 12 zones, which, is, which zone is closer or clear cut to which zone more than others? And what factors explain such within partition differences? There can be some useful and substantive interpretation and more like the implications to delve into. Like to my impression, like I think more work needs to be done regarding like what these zones means, like how to label them and what these zones reveal. Uh, I think, so that's my kind of suggestion to go into analysis better than the like, question out of this thinking. Because like as a social network scholar, so I was expecting like the typical sociogram of like 12 zones, which zone is closer <laughs> to which is clear. So that's, that, that was my kind of expectation. So I think this is a great model. I think the, the, the assuming this structure has a latent and the going with the method that you select, I think it's great. But I think there's more work, work more analytic uh, work can be done to further reveal about you know what these zones mean, and that's my suggestion. Yeah, yeah, okay. So if I interpret your question as more, it's more like a, what's the goodness of fit after the model, right? So in the <laughs> traditional statistical language, so um, I did this. I did this first. I um, I attacked the question about the, the dimension. Because you decide on which dimension is kind of like a more parsimony or less parsimony, right? So if you go back to that three part, you can you 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 don't have to to take a three, you can. So the the next elbow actually actually is a seven. So I also did the seven. So to do the seven is to come up with the twelve zone again, and then there's of course is a probabilistic. So it's not many. Uh, um, of them. So we use this adjusted rand in index to test the differences between these two sets of you know, zones. And it's very close to the 0.9999 something. It's very close to one. So then I just, I'm a more practical, is a more D, you know, I cannot even see it. <laughs> it's really hard to see what you mean by seven dimension. You know? <laughs> so I choose to use a more uh, parsimony ones, but I did this uh, um, uh, once. And then we could also do, um, so compare this, you must, you don't have it to the same dimension, right? So you can do, you can choose uh, 12 zones or 10 zones. More particle, I can choose 10 zones because the, the bigger is the close enough. You know, even even eight or six is, is still above ninety percent of the you know the the highest you know uh, big. So so those could be compared using you know using uh, whatever map error. There's so many ways and to 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 test these you know differences in different clustering. But could that's that's a question for you, Jimmy? Are this uh, kind of uh, likely? <laughs> not like sorry, uh, goodness of fit. What do you think? I also, oh, hold on, I also did a lot of work by, you know, looking at 
the workers a whole has the you know the probability belong to the 12 zones some of them one some of them up to one right so that's the that's that's the you know the the model and then if they are more the, the zones are more separable then then the workers probability belong to one zone as large right so i have i think it's more than 90 percent of the the law the 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 uh, workers are uh, uh, have uh, uh, greater than I forgot what was the 0.5. The 12 the 12 zones are greater than 0.5 and have a 96 percent of the workers are uh, using point more than 0.5 probability to to identify their membership because at the end anybody only have the membership belong to one zone only. So it's a pretty pretty good in that way. I could look at the very closely to everyone have X, Y, Z coordinates. I know where they are. I know how many are on the edge of this, you know, ellipsoid, you know, uh, uh, cloud. Ellipse cloud, I know that it's a outside or is it more inside? I mean, we can see the size too, right? So we have some dots are very close and then some are, some are wider. So, so those are easy to actually give me a sense of the, how to interpret and give the label of the, it's a very good, you know, suggestion. How to give the label is a, it's a constant problem in the literature, in the latent class analysis, right? And it was just a give, give uh, I give a very long, long label for latent classes of a trajectory analysis. I give it that long label. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard, but you know. Uh, if you can tell me more that uh, other ways, then that would be good. Oh, I think we are sharp at 11. So uh, anyone has other, uh, you know, ending questions, pressing questions to ask Professor Hao. Um, if not, I guess um, we will conclude here and we thank you for a great conversation and um i hope you have a good night. yeah thank you so much and then thank you for thank your you. attention and a great questions and great directions for me to move forward i'm going to following your guys work you know yeah thank you thank you very much thank you so much okay